can hear me, you can see me. Hello, how you doing? We almost ran the marathon, uh, and yeah, my name is Akos Hakrain. I work at a company called Prezi. Uh, it's an online presentation tool. Uh, we live in the cloud, and I'm going to demonstrate the product a little bit today for you guys. Um, and it's really cool because if you work at a presentation company, you learn a good number of things on how you can improve some of your presentation skills. This doesn't mean that I'm going to be a good presenter today. But for example, you can learn that if you rub your ears, then you can increase your focus. You guys can try it out as well. All right. So I'm really good at remembering silly things like this. Do you know what? Oh, wait a second. Oh, there we go. Do you see me? Yes. Do you know what I'm really not good at yet? It's remembering passwords. How many of you use a password manager? Oh, yes. OK, if, keep your hands up. So if you are using two password managers, keep your hands up. OK. Uh, how many of you use three or more? Uh, I do, actually. It's pretty embarrassing, maybe. But so the thing is that the market is flooded with password managers. And this notion, to me, is quite ridiculous, to be honest. So we have created technical depth for ourselves roughly 30 years ago, or 40, when, uh, whenever the internet and security started. And, and you know we are still living with it. Um, I did some research, and uh, you know I found like two dozen articles of what the greatest uh, password managers and uh, tools to help us remember things and generate new passwords and only remember a master password and stuff like this. And then you, you know you remember your master password in another master, master password, and it just gets it just gets crazy. The good news is that uh, we've realized that uh, that this is getting an issue. A couple of well, years ago, actually, it's not that long ago, and we started building, uh, we started building standards to avoid these things and to outsource hosting our users uh, at different user identifying systems. So, in 2005, for example, the OpenID uh, standard started to be established and implemented, and then in 2007 came the OAuth 1 protocol, and then later on came the OAuth 2 protocol. And uh, today, I would like to talk to you about uh, how, essentially, we built the OAuth 2 protocol and, and reused it using tools provided to Django and Python uh, at my company. So let's start off. Chapter 1. Knowledge is an onion. It appeals to us to peel layers upon layers, reels and reels. So two days ago, uh, Revo, he mentioned that uh, that the OAuth protocol, uh, the OAuth 2 protocol in itself is quite complicated, and we're not really going, he was not really going into details. The good news is, I'm giving it all to you right now. So, what is the OAuth 2 protocol? A little bit of fun history first. Uh, it all started at Twitter, actually. So, one day, uh, external Twitter users wanted to get access to their data in the Twitter systems, and uh, engineers at Twitter decided to implement this using the OpenID Connect protocol. But the thing is that OpenID Connect does not give you access to resources in, uh, in, the, in the system. It only gives you login permissions. So that's clearly not enough. And that was the point when, in 2006, I believe, the project to build the OAuth 1 protocol started. And then later on, it evolved to the OAuth 2 protocol. There are not a lot of differences between them. Uh, the biggest one is that the OAuth 2 protocol was designed to support multiple types of clients and multiple types of ways to get information from, from these systems. So there are a couple of grants here. A grant is basically uh, what type of client can get, in, can get access to the external system. So implicit grant basically means that you have a very thin client, like a a single page web application, but you still need access to a user's Google data, for example, like their email address or first name and last name. And, and basically, this is the least secure of the protocols. 
There's the resource owner credentials one. This one you know very well is the username password. So that's how it's easy to remember it. There's the client credentials. Rayvon mentioned this as well. And uh, the thing is that this, this one is probably the easiest to understand. There's a key on the server and the client side. Only two of them know about this. And then they exchange it and make sure. And this way, you can get informa information from the external system. And what's really interesting for us is the authorization code grant. And this is what we are going to dive deep into. If you want to learn about the other ones, there's, uh, there's going to be a link. And I'm going, also going to share my slides after the talk. So the authorization code grant, it basically uh, supports, uh, it basically has four, uh, four people who are taking part in this, or machines. The first one is the resource owner. That's me. That's you. It's the actual person who, ha who has the information. You know your name. You know your email address. You know who should have access to this data. There is the client. The client is the application you are going to use to connect, and you are going to give access to your information. There's going to be an authentication server, which is going to allow us to to, uh, to access this information, actually, and to verify that you can actually have this data. And then we have the resource server, which actually you have uploaded your data previously, like your first name, last name, email address. And then afterwards, uh, you want the client applications to have access to it. The entire flow starts by, ac by having a request to access uh, this data. It's Quite simple, actually. Basically, you click a login button on a website. There are a couple of things that are being sent here. For example, the client ID. This describes who would like to get this information. The response type, that's code. This describes basically that, hey, I want to get the information and access in this format. And the redirect URI, where should the external system call back if the authorization has happened? The next part is the coolest one and the most important one. Uh, this is when you get a nice consent screen uh, that you know, the external client application would like to get access to your data. And uh, it it's really important to stop here for a second and talk about this a little bit. So all of us heard that uh, recently there were issues with uh, Facebook OAuth and you know, personal data being leaked by third parties and stuff like this. Uh, if you want to stop people from uh, accessing, from third-party clients giving out the data that you host about your users, this is the place where you can stop them. Because if the user does not understand what's going to happen if they click continue here, then everything is messed up, right? So uh, if the user gives access to their information, well, it's really difficult to do anything afterwards that. Um, Yes, so let's assume that I have given consent to, uh, for Prezi to access my information from Facebook. Uh, and after this, the authorization server is going to send back a code. All right, I have generated this code uh, with, a, with a, the special secret that we share with each other. And then please send me the validation that it's actually you. So there's going to be an exchange at this point, and there's an authorization that's going to happen. There are two key parts of this authorization. The first one is the auth code that was sent just before. And the second one is the client secret that's, that's on the client. And, uh, and also the server, the authorization server, knows about it as well. So the auth authorization happens. We get back two tokens. The first one is the access token, and the second one is the refresh token. The access token is a short-lived token. That's what, that's what you use for communication with the external service. And the refresh token you use to refresh the access token. So after this, you can get all the information you want until the refresh token expires. And after that, you only need to log the user in again. Whew. That was crazy. All right. You did great. Here's a polar bear. <sighs> All right. So uh, the flow is quite complex. But in a sense, what it does is it makes sure it, it basically, this protocol ensures that when a user wants to 
give access to their data, they want a third-party application to get access to their data, then it's 100% sure that they have to consent to it. And I think this is super important to understand. And this is why the OAuth 2 protocol is great in ways. Maybe not so great in other ways. All right, um, let's shift on. And I would like to talk to you about a legacy application that is 11 years old. Names and places, time's, time's gone fast, twisting like an hourglass. All right, so as I mentioned, there's a legacy application that we call Prezi, the Prezi backend to be very specific, and it's 11 years old. Uh, it's a Django application, and uh, it's humongous, let's just say that, at least it was. And uh, you have to understand that an 11-year-old application being, brings a lot of, lot of things with it throughout the years. Uh, for example, we have custom authentication implemented in our systems. We have custom session handling. Uh, everything that session, uh, so basically, server-side sessions were not maintainable for us because we had too much traffic, which is you know, a great problem to have, but still we had to find different solutions to make, make our website faster. And of course, I bet most of you, just like us, we have custom user objects, uh, we have overridden the, uh, the user model in the, in the auth package, uh, and we have added multiple other models to it that actually describe what a Prezi user looks like. And it's quite safe to say at this point that we are kind of, you know, unicorns in this, but I bet that a lot of you feel the same way about your own code base here. So, you know, some time ago, um, a request came in from product that we need to enable more people to sign up to Prezi.com. And, uh, and, you know, the, the solution, the obvious solution is always social authentication in this case. So back in the day, there was a fantastic package called Django Social Auth uh, that was maintained by Omab. Uh, his name is Matthias. He's from Uruguay. He's a great guy. And uh, basically, at that point, we already had like super custom stuff implemented. So the Django Social Auth package did not cut for us entirely. So what is the sensible thing to do? Yes, we did a gigantic fork. Wow, Ooh, what's going to go wrong, right? Let me remind you that this fork happened in 2011. At least that's the latest trace I could find about it, because before 2011, we were not on GitHub, but a different uh, service that hosts our code. So it probably happened way before 2011. Let me give you another reminder. It's 2018 now, all right? so. Uh, Quite a few years have passed, um, so this code base started rotting, and rotting, and rotting, and we started adding more stuff to it. We started patching it. We started manually maintaining everything, basically, from the Facebook backend, to the LinkedIn backend, to whatever login you can imagine. And then, in 2017, came our favorite project, the classic one-button project, right? We all had these projects. You just need to put out one button. It's super easy, right? Well, luckily, we had time to work on it. So let's go to the next chapter. Fly dark despondency away, parent of frenzy and despair. Go seek the lurid haunts of care, nor hear thy haggard form display. I think Mary Robinson's beautiful poem describe perfectly how, t how happy my team was to burn the old system to the ground. So, uh, so basically, uh, what we did is, uh, is uh, we started research. We don't want to maintain an authentication system excessively. We want a beautiful shell that's going to cover everything for us, that's going to deal with everything. We don't want to write custom code. We just want it to work, right? And then during these research times, we encountered the social core package. The, the avocado is only there because I love avocados. I'm, I'm super millennial. It's fine. Um, so we discovered the social core package. And the social core package, what it, in essence, what it does 
is uh, it provides social authentication that's framework independent. And this is exactly what we needed. This is exactly what, uh, what Prezi needed at this point, because we had so much custom code that we didn't want to fork uh, another Django social authentication package again. We wanted to write a little bit of code around so uh, so the core part of social authentication, and then, uh, and then you know, just maintain that part, and the rest is going to just work. So the social core, I want to explain to you what are the parts of it uh, in very high level. And it's got three main parts. The first one is the backends. The second one are the pipelines. And the third one are the strategies. Backends are really simple. This is most likely the easiest to understand. Uh, the idea behind the backends is, what is the external provider that, that I want to get my information from? What data do I want from this uh, external uh, uh, information provider to give me? And a couple of other functionalities. So let's run a uh, some examples. The first one is the Google one. This is, uh, quite, this is quite standard. Everybody has nowadays a Google login button on their website, even Prezi. Woo and uh, you can see here that uh, you know, it's got uh, the URL where I can fetch the access token from. It's got uh, where I can revoke uh, the access tokens. It's got what scope I can, I can get from these tokens. And you know, this, uh, the Facebook one is awfully similar to this. So why not have a system for this? And this is exactly what Matthias was thinking when he was designing uh, the social authentication systems. So. Um, I want to highlight one small thing, though, that comes from the OAuth 2 protocol. Please, uh, please check what the revoke token method is for the Facebook one. It's a delete, right? For Google, it's a get. So this shows that the OAuth 2 protocol is not too strict on what exactly uh, which uh, the implementation should look like, it only gives us this framework of consent from the user. And I just want to throw in one more that blew my mind when I was scrolling through the backends. This is the Battle.net uh, OAuth. So basically, you, can sign, you could sign up to Prezi.com, let's say, with your Battle.net account if we enable the button there on the front end, which is, you know, I find super ridiculous, and that you can import your World of Warcraft characters into your Prezi's. I don't know, I just came up with this. But yeah, so I think if, uh, if I remember correctly, there are around 170 supported backends in Social Core. So if you want to log in your users using any type of backend, I'm fairly certain you're going to find it. All right, pipelines. This is my favorite part. Uh, yeah, we already went through this, so we're not going to go through it again. Uh, basically, the idea of pipelines is that during the authentication flow, you can run custom code. You can run whatever code you want to write. And essentially, this, can, this has a lot of implications and is super powerful. It, you can, for example, do custom login, sign up uh, flows. You can do logging if you want. Like, so we put the audit logging for our security team in this, in this part of the code. You can also send out marketing emails if you really like, hey, and we no just noticed that you signed up. Want to try out these cool things? For example, we integrate with Google in this way, blah, blah, blah. Very, very cool. I would like to focus a little bit on the, on the signing up part, though. So uh, we separate three real cases when there's social sign in or sign up. First one is logging the user in. The second one is signing the user up. Uh, and the third one is association. And I'm going to explain what these are. Logging in is basically the case when the user exists in your system and they exist in the external system as well. You want the login to be as smooth as possible. It should be one click, and that's it. The user is already in your system, and you're done. Signing up. So when you go on your mobile phone and you download an application and there's a, and there's a button that says login with Google, then uh, you tap it. And if you don't have an account in the system, you should still be able to log in immediately, right? So in the social authentication pipeline, we just simply added uh, a user creation step. And then immediately, we did not need to care about you know, the user being uh, not logged in. 
and then the association, and this is probably the most interesting part of all of it. It's when the user somehow already exists in your system, um, uh, and uh, essentially what you want to achieve here is, is that when they click the button, but, oh, sorry, so they exist in your system, but the two accounts are not connected with the external system yet. So somehow you have to verify that these are the two same people and connect the two accounts. And uh, I'm going to show a quick demo of how we solved for this problem in a moment. Uh, touching on strategies, just for a couple of words, strategies are the things that take care of the, the request, the response objects, how rendering happens in the framework, uh, how uh, sessions are handled, and how settings are accessed in this framework. Now, the good news is that this sounds super overwhelming, but if you just go to the Python social out GitHub handle, uh, everything from this is done for Django. So if you are, ha don't, are not running super custom code like we do, you can just pip install uh, social app Django, put like three configurations in your, in your config files, and you are already good to go with your social login system. It's insanely powerful. All right. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, roadblocks and achievements that we have bumped into on the way. I searched so high, I searched so low, and wiped the cool sweat of my bro in quest of someone who would be just themselves in front of me. So uh, we're going to touch two things here, uh, what type of issues we had with the databases and, uh, and the native clients, the mobile applications and the desktops that, that we have implemented. Um, it was quite unfortunate that we wanted to do the social authentication system migration during the time when we were moving from pure iron to the cloud with our massive infrastructure. So we ran into a couple of issues here, and we had to run a couple of, you know, complicated database queries and, uh, and set, up, uh, set up a connection between between uh, RDS and, uh, I mean, the Amazon Web Services and physical servers. We had to set up complex replications, but uh, in the end, it was a huge learning, and now at least we can do it, right? So if it comes up again, then it's cool. It was really good that we moved to the cloud, by the way, because uh, after the release, a couple of weeks later, uh, when we stopped the A-B test for the Google login, then, uh, then we, had, uh, we had, had an outage because our database servers got overloaded. And all I had to do was select a, a bigger database size from a dropdown on the Amazon console, and two minutes later, the outage was over. So that was cool. Um, all right. Let's talk a bit about the mobile clients. Did you guys, so uh, after the release, we started getting, uh, we started getting notices from Apple, actually, that uh, our login and sign-up flow is too good because apparently when you are working, uh, working with uh, Apple, uh, with iOS applications, you cannot sign up users unless your application is paying and you are paying some money to Apple. So our application is free, so uh, we decided to just disable Google uh, user sign-up uh, uh, from iOS devices. But you know, using the power of pipelines, it only took like two hours of work to do, uh, deployment included. Um, also, did you know that you can sign up to Facebook using only your mobile phone, your phone number? We did not know this, but luckily our new monitoring system immediately alerted us that there are a lot of users who are coming in without a valid email address. And we were like, what the hell? And then, you know, we read uh, the Facebook user manual or whatever that is, and then, you, you know, we found out that, oh, you can actually just sign up using your phone number. So we could not come up with a very elegant solution, but still we built a quick view for this, and we notified the users that, hey, we noticed that you don't have an email address set up with your account. Uh, you, uh, we saw that you were trying to use Facebook. You can go to this website and learn how you can add an email address to your Facebook account. Super nice, right? So some users were able to find their way back to our website this way, and that's super useful. All right. Um, a couple of achievements that I want to talk about uh, regarding this project, you know, apart from 
having a super scalable social authentication system now which scales horizontally and vertically as well. I showed it the other way, it's fine. No, I showed it right, it's cool. So uh, which scales horizontally and vertically as well. I'm also really proud of the, uh, of the association flow. So here I'm going to tap sign in with the Google and uh, I tap my email address and now what the application is gonna tell me it's a bit slow because in my hotel the internet was not that good. Uh, that you know, I received an email. I go, uh, I tap the button. It opens my email client. I open the email itself. It tells me all sorts of stuff like you know where the login happened and stuff like this. I click verify my account, and with the power of deep linking, we were able to open back the application. And this basically means that, you know, we keep the user in one flow, they don't have to think about anything, and everything just works. So, yeah, make sure to look at your tool set when you are building your association flow, because you can do really, really cool stuff with today's technologies. The other really cool thing is that, uh, you know, we were so happy about this package that we decided to contribute back. And, uh, and practically, uh, we fixed bugs, security concerns, we improved on the pipeline system, and uh, it was really great uh, collaborating with Matthias. Cool. Um, to wrap this up, if there are two things that you take away today, these should be the two GitHub uh, handles that you check out. If you did not have time to take a screenshot, I'm going to send out this link in roughly three minutes to the Talks channel. This is basically this presentation. You can click through it and uh, find all the links in there. Um, this is my face uh, in my natural habitat next to a glass of wine. Um, yeah, you can find me on social media, GitHub. You can send me an email uh, at akosh at prezi.com if you have any questions that I cannot answer here or uh, off stage. And yeah, that was an O2O auth. Thank you so much.